Welcome back to Painting Trafalgar. It's a beautiful day here in Jersey City, but chilly. I'm working on that painting that I had started, uh, geez, I guess it seems like a month ago now. Remember the one I was working from this photograph of the models? Um, and then I had a, a painting, a, a discussion about the waves and stuff and how that I went into great detail about the paintings of the waves. I found this other painting that looks a lot like what I'm doing. How about that, huh? And I feel like this guy's done a better job with the same kind of composition. He's really focusing just on the bow, and um, you can see the forecourse and the way it's wrinkled. And that's what I want to talk about. I think that's what I wanted to talk about. There's a lot of things to talk about on this painting, but one of the things is this uh, wrinkled up uh, forecourse. It's been brailed up and then the buntlands have been hauled on and the cluelands have been hauled on and that'll take some explaining and i've done this on all my ship models and you get this uh wedge shape triangular shape from the the bunch of the fabric most of the sail when it gets it, this is a rectangular sail by the way when it's hanging normally it would hang right into this space right here and uh, let me go in the other room and look at this other model here. Same thing. This is the model that I photographed for the painting I'm working on. And there are these particular wrinkles that appear because the canvas is being drawn up by six points, I think. Like there's three points on each side on the front and one point on the back. So that's uh, eight different points are hauled on lines are being hauled on to bring it up. Now I had built this model a long time ago that actually functions. It's got the actual lines that you would haul on and um, I get the same shape. This one I left off the leech lines which would have been attached right here on these little kringles. And so if you look at this, if this was hauled up to a block on the yard properly it would go like this and then I have this more pointy instead of a bow tie shape Live and learn. Uh, here's a square sail that's uh, that's set. So you can see that's how it's supposed to look. It's a long rectangle. And the cluelands are the ones that are on the, on the back. And they would haul the sail up this way from the back. And then the buntlands are attached on the front of the sail. And they haul it up from the front. So you get this weird, this corner folds up and back. And then these corners fold up and forward and you get this weird twist. So I was having so much trouble with it that I built a full-scale model. <laughs> so here's the clues drawn up from, this is the after aspect of the sail, right? And then this is the forward end of the sail. These would be the buntlands hauling it up. So I hope to look at this model, uh, which looks great when I hang it in my window. Um, and it functions, like these lines down here, I can, I can ease off and I can have the square sail set. But I'm going to use that to paint this, because I was trying to paint this and imagining the wind blowing on it and having tremendous difficulties. Um, like I say, this is, this is the time frame of this painting at some point in the stormy afternoon of the following day or the day after. So it's Tuesday or Wednesday after the Battle of Trafalgar, which was on Monday. And there's a dismasted 74. Um, there's... Uh, the English are trying to secure their prizes. The ships that had surrendered to them now belong to them, but now they have to try to operate them and get them to safety. And what that meant was throwing uh, cables to them. The cable is the line that comes out of the bow of the ship and attaches to the anchor. You could take that cable and tie two of them together end to end and use that as a tow rope too. So there's, if you read the log books, which I've been doing, the, in the following days, it's all about who's getting towed by who and how many cables have broken while they're doing it because the sea is still really lumpy and the winds are still really high and all the ships are damaged. So there's this struggle to get ships in tow. So this guy here is throwing a heaving line. So he has a rope with a weight on the end of it, which he's spinning around in his head, you know, in, like a lariat, and then he's going to throw it to this ship. That's a lighter line. They'll haul on that line. The people on the stricken ship will haul it in, and then on the end of it, they'll, the crew of the frigate will tie a cable, and then they will try to tow 
this ship, which is now in this, the way it's depicted here, kind of floating around as a hulk with no control. So I'm trying to show the guys on the fore deck up here, the forecastle. There's the stump of the foremast. They are trying to um, erect some kind of a spar on here. And that's what happened. Um, the, the mast broke right here. On this drawing, which we've shown before, the mizzen mast broke off. And they tied what could be a stuncil bone. No, it's too long for a stuncil bone. This might be a jib bone onto it so that you can actually see the lashing here where they just lashed it on there. And that's what they were doing. They were kind of trying to lash spars together so they could hang sails off of them so they could get some kind of control over their ships because they were on that lee shore. See my episode on... What was the title of it? It was the last one I did chronologically um, I, where I just gave the history of the whole battle from beginning to end. So if you haven't, if you haven't seen that one, you should... You should uh, watch that one. What else would I talk about while I had you here, while I'm looking at a painting? Um, the color of the sails is something that I've always been kind of uh, picky about and critical of. Um, everybody knows what the color white is, right? Like, here's a white piece of paper. The sails are ostensibly white, right? But they're not really. Like, here's this one, I actually took the trouble to dye it just a little bit because it's not white. It's it's like a gray. And um, like here's some actual canvas here that you get at the art supply store. And it is like a cream color at best. It's just not a bright, bright white. Like there's that white paper against it. And again and again on ship models, I see this wrong color, this bright, bright white. So the other issue with this is that I'm, the light in this painting is coming from somewhere in the background towards the viewer. So the stuff in the foreground, all the ship and everything, is dark. So here's my white piece of paper, right? If I put it in front of the sun, now my white piece of paper seems dark, right? It's because the sun's coming from behind it. It's coming from out the window and coming towards me. So even though this is white, I have to make it gray. And then I have to decide exactly how gray to make it to show the white sails with the semi-translucency that they would have. There's a tiny bit of translucency. Um, just in the same way that these Venetian blinds have a little bit of translucency. Um, how much light am I dealing with? And this painting has been a problem for me because I've just not been really clear from the outset about how much light there was going to be. And so what that has meant is I'm kind of struggling with these things that are in brighter light, air quotes light, even though it's a cloudy day. I don't want there to be the appearance of bright sunlight. Um, so the only thing that I have to work with is the color tone. So in bright sunlight, these sails would be a brighter yellowish white in the brilliant sun. They'd be reflecting more like this does when I put this in the, in the sunlight. Like when this gets in the sunlight, it's... <laughs> All right, so I'm getting confused here, even in my own mind, trying to stick to the topic. But there's a, there's a range of... Of colors and then the ranges of colors are also affected by the circumstances in which they're being hit by the light and I think that's like getting at the fundamentals of painting a realistic painting anything that looks like realism is going to have to have in it a formula describing how the light is behaving as it strikes the objects and then you as the viewer you're not really aware of that that's happening behind the scenes that's um that's kind of like the hand inside the, the sock puppet. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, the person painting it is like, uh, you know, orchestrating all that stuff. And they have to be aware of it. And I think in my case, that's where I, my painting succeed or fail, is when I don't accurately lay out where the light is hitting and how hard is it hitting and what effect is that light having as it bounces off the thing that I'm painting. Um, this one, nine minutes. I could make this one ten minutes if I stop right now. But I did want to talk about the color of the water a little bit, too. I've got, like, this seafoam green that you see in, um, bridesmaids' dresses <laughs> that people hate. Um, and it, to me, it's a compromise. I wanted to have color there. Um, this is more of a grayish purple. And I think, like, a, a stormy sea gray color is is what this calls for. But just relentless gray all the time also doesn't seem as appealing. Um, so I'm trying to work some color in there, and I'm not convinced that I've that I haven't made it too green. 
So you might see me go over this stuff and make it bluer before I declare this painting done. What else does this painting need to be finished? Um, like I said, this all has to get repainted. And I'm not really happy about this whole area up here because I just haven't paid attention to it. But I'm looking up underneath the top at uh, all the rigging that's sort of in, in silhouette there and then the heads of the guys who are furling the sail. Um, that needs to be addressed. This ship has no anchors on it and I've been trying to look into anchor stowage. I believe the anchor stowage on this model is accurate. They've got um, an anchor on the bow. And do I have a, two anchors on this side? Yeah, on this side there's two anchors. So this, this is more realistic. The ships would have more than one anchor and they'd have one ready to go very frequently, meaning that its hoss is going into the hoss hole, so to drop this anchor, they just need to let it go. And then they have two or more in the chains. This platform that all of this rigging is attached to, this is like a little um, horizontal seat. It's called the channel. Um, they've got the anchor attached to that and the fluke of the anchor is sitting on this little pad over here and not visible on this model because it's such a small scale is um, there's no lashing this should all be lashed really tight because this would be extraordinarily heavy you can imagine this is all made out of iron a human figure is about, like a little bit taller than this row of, of uh, hammocks here so they're enormous and that's part of the problem nowadays modern anchors are just not that big nobody on replica sailing ships are using historically accurate, enormous anchors. They're using smaller Danforth anchors that are more efficient with, with the ship, the, the design and the shape. Um, yeah, so that's, that's now making my video last way longer than it should be. I don't know, I'm like, I, I am not really happy with two thumbs up about this painting. And I think in part because it's not looking the way I imagined it was gonna look because when I got so excited about this photograph, this original photograph that I like so much, um, it doesn't look like this. You can see how it's based on that and where it's coming from, but it's changed into something else. And I, I, I kind of feel like I'm half my brain is trying to make it look like that other painting. And the other half is trying to take what I have here. That's the smarter half of my brain and, uh, not fix it, but go with it, you know, take it like, there's some writers who say that they don't plan their novel. They start them, and then as they're writing them, the novel tells them what to write. And that's true, to to some extent with the painting, because you... I, I had a teacher, a sculpture teacher of mine, he said, don't stick to the idea, because the, if you have an idea before you begin, and you start with the idea, um, the, the artwork itself changes as you work on it. And... It has all kinds of potential. It can go in all these different directions, but not if you keep sticking with the idea. You know, if you're the one holding it to this idea, you've drawn a much smaller circle into which the painting can exist. But if you go with the possibilities, this painting could go anywhere. That could be a good thing. It can be a bad thing because then you can sink a lot of time into the painting and maybe you should have stuck with the idea a little bit. Somewhere in there is the happy medium. And this painting right now has, gone beyond what the idea was in some of the colors at any rate like when i looked at this original painting or photograph it looked like it had a lot more orangey brownish colors and when i look at this it doesn't really have those it's a cooler painting with cooler tones so thanks for visiting once again this has been painting trafalgar and um if you've been paying attention it's a it's a series of videos about the battle of trafalgar plus my attempts to do paintings that are about the Battle of Trafalgar. And I keep hoping I'm actually going to get to a painting where you're going to see the ships in the battle, <laughs> shooting at each other with cannons and puffs of smoke and all that. And I still don't think I'm ready for that. You know, I'm going to certainly need to finish this one before I can even contemplate the next one. But I'm going to get there. And if you'll keep watching, I will keep videotaping. So, great. Thanks for spending your time with me here and uh, leave, um, I don't know if it's a review or just comments or something. I see, I can see who's, uh, like how many views my videos are getting and uh, some are getting more views than others. I don't know if those are actual warm bodied human beings or if they're bots that are doing it for ad purposes, who knows. But um, 
yeah, the idea is grow the audience, get the word out there. And part of that would be with interacting with your public. And I am amenable to you asking questions in the comments. I will answer them. Thanks. Bye for now.